Okay, well, we're gonna get started. Good morning, HR Career Exploration Panel attendees. We welcome you here today. My name is Crystal Murray, and I'm an Associate Executive Director for the Greater Los Angeles Federal Executive Board. And some of you students may have never heard of the Federal Executive Board, but FEBs, which we call it, the Federal Executive Board, FEBs were established by a Presidential Directive in 1961 and are a forum for communication and collaboration among federal agencies outside of Washington, D.C. And approximately 85% of all federal employees work outside of the National Capital Region. The national network of 28 FEBs located in areas of significant federal populations serve the cornerstone for strategic partnering in government. The Greater Los Angeles FEB currently serves 275 federal agencies in the Southern California area. So that shows you how many opportunities are out there for federal employment. Also, the FEB is a founding member of G2U, Government to University Alliance. The Los Angeles Alliance is led by SCAG, the Southern California Association of Government. We are grateful to SCAG for their audiovisual support for this career exploration series. LAGTU initiated um, and launched over a year ago. And one of our projects is this seven month career exploration series. Each session focuses on a different major occupation. So today we're having our HR occupation, our human resource management occupation that we'll be focusing on. There are literally thousands, like I said, 275 to be exact in the Los Angeles area that are looking for talent. And we hope that today's session will inspire you to consider public service because it's a noble calling. So because of the size of today's audience, we will be taking comments and questions only in the chat box. So please put your comments there. We will be actively monitoring the chat so that we can make sure all of your questions are answered. Now, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Thomas J. Norman, who will be today's moderator. Professor Norman teaches management at California State University, Dominguez Hills. He received his BA from Harvard University, cum laude, and, and his MA and PhD degrees in human resource and industrial relations from the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on the impact of globalization on the future of the employment relationship. He has authored one book, and written more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. He also contributes to one of the leading management textbooks, Management, Leading and Collaborating in a Competitive World, published by McGraw-Hill. Hill. As the founder of the organization, Leadership Effectiveness Lab, sorry, Leadership or Founder of the organization Leadership Effectiveness Lab, Dr. Norman advises university leaders on management education in East Asia, Eastern Europe, and Africa. He also was a founder of his campus innovation incubator that teaches social entrepreneurship to more than 15 clients annually. I will now turn the mic over to Professor Norman. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Ms. Murray, and it's my pleasure I get to introduce our three panelists. Uh, we have a, a great group. One of the, the key elements is to uh, listen to the differences between the different levels of government. Uh, and I'm going to begin just going in alphabetical order, so the, the panelists have a sense of, of when I'll be speaking about each of you. Uh, and one of our, our first panelists, uh, camera's not working, uh, but it is my pleasure to introduce Hector Cervantes. Uh, he assumed his position as Associate uh, Center Director in ACD for the Resource Management Branch with the California Service Center uh, in 2018. In this capacity, he provides leadership, strategic guidance, and program management for the center as a member of the senior leadership team. Previous to this role, he served as Deputy Safety and Security Director for the Department of Navy Strategic Weapons Facility uh, at um, Atlantic and Kings Bay, Georgia. That was from 2009 to 2013. 
There, he provided leadership, strategic guidance, and program management for three critical national safety and security programs, the New uh, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, National Level Exercise for Nuclear Weapons Accident Incident Response, and the All Hazards Emergency Manager for the Atlantic Submarine Fleet's Nuclear Ballistic Missile Stockpile. Prior to this, he retired in 2007 from a distinguished 21-year career with the United States Navy as a surface warfare officer, where he had progressively challenging tours, selection up to uh, executive officer, commanding officer, and chief of staff for an expeditionary strike group. He's a decorated combat veteran of Desert Shield, Desert Storm, holds three master's degrees in business administration with a focus on government financial management, national strategy and decision-making, and in public policy from the Naval Postgraduate School. He holds a BA in business administration from the University of Washington. <clears throat> Mr. Cervantes recently completed uh, the USCIS Executive Potential Program and is actively pursuing selection into a Senior Executive Series Candidate Development Program, culminating in an OPM Executive Core Qualification Certificate to continue his public service as one of the Senior Executive Team. Next, I would like to um, provide an introduction to Dr. Joan Tournay, well, a colleague of the system I'm a part of, the Cal State University. Uh, she has been in the human resource higher education field for nearly 20 years. Currently, she is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Workforce Strategies in the Chancellor's um, Office of Human Resources at the California State University. In her current role, she provides strategic direction with a focus on strategic and workforce planning, identifying goals and initiatives, organizational excellence and communications for the vice chancellor, functional HR leadership, and the HR division. She was instrumental in the development of the division's first three-year strategic plan. She also oversees and provides leadership to the HR department, um, servicing the chancellor's office. Previously, she was chief of staff to the vice chancellor of HR, served as director of HR for workforce planning at Santa Clara University uh, for five years, and she spent 10 years at San Jose State University in various human resource roles. She received her bachelor's degree in international business at the University of San Francisco, her master's degree in sociology at San Jose State University, and her doctoral degree in organization and leadership from the University of San Francisco. She has studied in Tokyo, Japan, and Salzburg, Austria. Her research interests are leadership, organizational excellence, diversity, equity and inclusion, and strategic planning, Asian Pacific American leaders in higher education, workforce planning, emotions at work, work and family, women at work, mentoring, teams at work, and the role of human resources in organizational and student success. Joan also served as an adjunct lecturer at the Sociology Department and College of Business at San Jose State University. Dr. Tournay holds professional certifications as a Society of Human Resource Management, Senior Certification Professional, that's the SHRM uh, SCP, Professional Human Resource Certificate, the PHR, Business Process Design for Strategic Management from MIT, Cultural Intelligence and Unconscious Bias Facilitator, the Prosky Change Practitioner, and holds a Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt. She also served as a Personnel Commissioner in her former town, the city of Gilroy, Garlic Capital of the World, and held leadership roles, including president of the CUPA HR, Northern California chapter. She's committed to upholding personal and organizational continuous improvement and is an advocate for equal access to higher education and student success. We want to welcome her. And our, our final panelist is, is the one that I'll ask to begin with the format we're going to have. I'm going to ask each of the panelists uh, to introduce their agency and introduce how they uh, came to arrive at the position of their agency. So starting with their education and moving up or, or working us backward, um, I don't have the bio for uh, Mr. Edward uh, Vicuna, F. Vicuna, uh, but I do know he's a, a career Navy uh, person with 20 years and that's, that's as much as I have. So I'm gonna um, ask us to give a warm introduction, you know, virtual clap to each of the panelists and then hand the mic over to Mr. Vicuna. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Norman, and uh, I apologize for uh, not being more attendant with the bio and even uh, scheduling this event. I'm very pleased to be part of this, and I'm very impressed with the panel members and their credentials. Um, my story is pretty simple. I'm, I'm very privileged and blessed to be the Human Resource Director at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Port Wayneemi Division. We're located in Ventura County, which is about uh, 60 miles um, so, uh, north of Los Angeles area. 
And we're blessed in Ventura County to have a deep water port at Port Wainimi and an airfield at Point Magoo. And we're unique in the sense that we have unique geographic assets that allow us to support the Navy mission. Um, my current command, uh, my current activity is about 2,800 people strong. We're scientists and engineers. We do combat systems engineering support and other, uh, other fleet mission support for a great Navy. Uh, my background uh, spans many, many administrations. I, I started in, during the Reagan administration in 1984 with the Pacific Missile Test Center here in Ventura County. So I started as an HR intern. I came out of college with a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. I started as an HR professional in 1984 and I worked through all the major functions of HR. During that time frame, I was blessed in that the government, the Navy supported me in getting a master's degree from Chapman College. Um, so that degree was in human resource management. It was a high, hybrid degree, one of the first of its kind really at that time. And I was fortunate to get that education. Um, my life also in HR mirrored the change that went through the government. When we went into the 90s, uh, the Reagan era of exp expansion and DOD kind of shrunk up, right? And we went into a, a, an era of retrenchment in the Department of Defense. So I went from an era of massive hiring hiring flexibilities, and then we went into an era of downsizing. There were a number of commercial activities that went, uh, commercial activity studies that were called in the federal government, which translated into reductions in force. So I spent a lot of my, the 1990s, learning the dark side of, of human resources in a way, downsizing, uh, bracking people, placing people in jobs. So that helped shape me in a way and during that, during that affiliation, I worked with uh, NAFAC, CNIC, different elements of Navy, and I was privileged in 2013 to wind up as an HR director here at PhD. So my career spans 30 years. It's all been in Ventura County, but I've been privileged to support different naval enterprises that have impacted our, our world and our country's safety. Uh, so that's kind of the sum up of who I am. Um, I think that's good for now. Okay, let's um, <clears throat> reverse, we're on the panel then. Um, and, and Dr. Trené, do you want to elaborate? You know, we've got a, a taste of who you are from your bio, but could you walk uh, our students through, through the journey um, of HR? Um, in many cases, it's not as specific as HR intern up, but in some cases it is. Uh, so please, you know, spend at least five minutes, if you, if you would, uh, filling that in and we'll go to the next panelist. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Norman. And hello again, everyone, good morning. And again, um, thank you, Dr. Norman for the introduction. Um, as noted, I've been in um, HR field for almost uh, 20 years now, all in the higher education industry, uh, both private and public. I spent about 10 years at San Jose State University in various HR roles, starting with being actually a temp personnel assistant uh, right after receiving my bachelor's degree. Um, my duties were receiving calls, date stamping paperwork, and filing uh, the good old personal files. Um, at that time, I was filling in for someone who actually um, went on leave. And as part of my journey, I believe I ended up with seven various titles and roles within the HR department up to becoming the director of HR administrative services as I continually learned, grow, and contributed in the department. Um, some of the positions were uh, promotions and others I had to go through a competitive process. As I noted, there were like seven different roles in, in 10 years that I've held there. Um, I then transitioned to a Jesuit private university at Santa Clara University as the associate director of human resource there for about five years. And I'm happy to say I came home and came back to the California State University as the chief of staff to the vice chancellor of human resources and actually made that move from Northern California to Southern California. As you heard, Dr. Norman noted my uh, previous hometown was uh, Gilroy, early capital of the world. Um, in 2019, I became the assistant vice chancellor of workforce strategies and the chancellor's office human resources, which is now my current role. So I know from my bio, um, I know Dr. Norman went through my role. So I just kind of wanted to expand 
that it's been a really rewarding um, experience and journey um, being in the HR field for now 20 years in higher ed and 14 of those um, has been at the California State University. Um, I'm a product of the CSU and really proud to be part of that 4 million uh, living alumni. I uh, received my bachelor's, bachelor's degree in international business and my doctoral degree in organization and leadership from the University of San Francisco, but I attended and attained my master's sociology uh, from San Jose State while actually working full time and received the fee waiver benefit, which is a great benefit working for the CSU and other higher education institution that supports continuous learning. And I hope that you are interested in pursuing uh, more of um, your, your education. Um, the CSU has 23 campuses, approximately 486,000 students. Um, special acknowledgement and welcome to the CSU students today. I know there are a, a number of you tuning in. Um, we have 56,000 employees and eight union groups. Um, it's one of the largest employers in the state of California, uh, providing high quality and affordable college experience, higher education and degrees. And actually, according to a recent uh, CSU news, while the CSU's alumni have spread out across the globe, about 84% of them remain in California, with one in 10 of all workers in the state holding a CSU degree, and one in every 20 Americans with a college degree earned in at CSU, uh, making the CSU's alumni network larger than the population of 23 individual US states, and I say that to, to describe our agency or how, how big the CSU is and all the opportunities that could come with it. Um, CSU alumni are working at all levels to serve their communities, grow the economy, and lead California to a better future in our country. Um, with that, I think uh, bringing it back as an HR administrator in the CSU, or any employee at any level in the CSU, we get to be part of something very special, you know, beyond our positions, roles, and careers. We get to make a difference and positive contributions to people's lives. Um, and according and quoting our chancellor, Dr. Castro, from his opening remarks in the third student success summit, he noted students faculty, staff, administrators, alumni, and friends, we all have a role to play for uh, student success. And at the CSU, we take our roles beyond our position descriptions and find ways to engage and support the students to enhance their college experience and ultimately attain their degrees, whether that is in the classroom, various academic leadership, student engagement programs. So I think if you love working with people and find satisfaction in helping others and the organization, HR field may be an ideal fit for you. And especially in higher ed, that's where I come from. Um, as an HR professional, you'll have a unique perspective into the organization due to the nature of the job. You'll have a strong understanding of an organization's priorities and challenges and also have the ability to influence the future of the organization based on the employment decisions made in partnership with management, as well as being able to influence the organization's culture. Um, there are many various areas in HR, and I think that you've heard um, from um, Edward, um, you can specialize in or be a generalist and do it all. You know, so it truly depends on how the organization set up. In the CSU, we have 24 HR departments, one in each campus and the chancellor's office located here in Long Beach where I'm now. Each department structured slightly different based on various factors such as number of staff, faculty, history, culture, internal and external talent availability, all those factor in how an HR department is structured. Some of the HR positions are either generalists or specific to an HR area like talent acquisition or recruitment, benefits, classification, compensation, 
HR information system, employee labor relations, compliance, diversity and inclusion, training, and specific HR programs, such as employee onboarding, employee recognition, wellness, and other HR programs. And if I miss something, I'm sure I think Edward or Hector will mention them. Um, with the various, H, um, various areas in HR and the changing landscape of the work environment, no work day is ever the same. It's very dynamic. Um, you confront a variety of challenges from administrative tasks like drafting contracts and reviewing applications to more people-oriented tasks like serving employees to inform ideas on how best to implement new work strategies and leadership and strategic focus by providing guidance and advice to managers and executives on their organizational structures, how to increase employee engagement, morale, and performance. So for some, one day you may be helping an employee navigate changes to their health insurance, and the next you could be dealing with the effects of new laws or regulations. So challenges like these can keep the work engaging, no matter how long um, you're in the field. Uh, looks like Edward been there 30 years and been here 20 years in HR. So I'm not going to I'm not going to not mention and encourage you to check uh, CSU careers that Cal State got edu to view the various positions um, available in the CSU. So I think um, I know it probably took up a lot of time, but I wanted to make sure to just give a, a quick overview. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. And perhaps you uh, would want to share in the chat for the all the attendees that link so they can kind of follow along and get that early access to those great jobs. All right, now going back to um, our first panelist alphabetically, um, Hector Cervantes, could you take us uh, you know, through that journey in, in whichever order of uh, being that college graduate, wondering what, what your career would be like, uh, or um, you know, maybe may a little bit different than military, but being, being younger and um, you know, the, some of the stories on the path to where you are today. Yes, good morning, Dr. Norman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me join. It's a true privilege uh, to be uh, among uh, some uh, great panelists and, and, of course, all of you. Uh, uh, so uh, before, you know, I'll, I'll kind of bring you around my story. So first, uh, I'd like to, you know, just tell you that I work for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, whose uh, mission, again, is to, uh, with honor and integrity, we will safeguard the American people our homeland and our values. So Homeland Security has 14 uh, component agencies. I happen to work for the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USEIS. Um, and our mission statement is uh, to administer the nation's lawful immigration system, safeguarding its integrity and promise by efficiently and fairly adjudicating requests for immigration benefits while protecting Americans securing the homeland and honoring our values. So I, I, I wanted to start with that because I, that, that, that will show my full circle story. Again, you know, my name is Hector Chavantes. I was born in Mexico. I migrated to the United States uh, um, lawfully back in 19, uh, 1979. So I'm dating myself a little bit. Uh, it was it was uh, you know one of those stories that, that you hear of um, you know uh, the parents looking for that American dream. Uh, as, as soon as we um, we migrated to the states, I started high school. I uh, was coming in as I mentioned at 12th grade, so I had to start back to first grade. So that was quite the shock, but uh, but I got through it. I was able to go through uh, basically elementary school in uh, two uh, in semester increments. So I was able to pretty much get caught up with. Uh, uh, Peer, uh, you know, kids my age by the time I, I got to junior high. Uh, immediately upon, uh, and this is in southeast uh, Texas, is what is called the Rio Grande Valley. Um, uh, immediately after, upon graduation, I joined the, the Navy as an enlisted submarine, um, uh, sub, uh, submarine uh, uh, sailor. I, was, I served on two different Trident ballistic submarines. And while I was there, I started taking classes because, again, that was the one thing uh, out of that American dream that my parents wanted me to complete and go to college. So I wanted to uh, maximize uh, uh, their efforts um, by, by doing that. Uh, I was able to um, 
complete my associate's degree while I was still on submarines, and that um, qualified me for what at the time was called an enlisted commissioning program, and I was able to complete my bachelor's degree at the University of Washington, and once I was uh, completed that, I was commissioned as a naval officer. Uh, from there, my career really took off. I was very lucky and fortunate that with some hard work and, and as I mentioned, just uh, being at the right place at the right time, uh, I was able to promote through progressively challenging tours and had the honor and privilege to have command of a ship and, uh, and, 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 and did some great, amazing uh, stuff across 21 years in the U.S. Navy. So, uh, you know, to Mr. Kuna, a fellow sailor, you know, I definitely um, – something that I'm sure he had an amazing experience as well as even serving as a, as in a uh, civilian um, uh, expert. Um, after 21 years, I, I felt that it was, it was time to uh, of amazing uh, career and, and service. It was time to, to continue on. And I was very fortunate to find the public service or the public civilian service uh, sector where I, um, I initially started working for the Department of Defense. Uh, down in Kings Bay, Georgia, where I happened to be uh, stationed, and uh, and then uh, but I was doing something completely different, uh, something that was more attuned to my uh, uh, humble beginnings as a submarine, and I was working on Trident ballistic missiles, uh, and I was doing a lot of the emergency management and uh, and uh, start treaties with the uh, Russians, and and all kinds of other very cool stuff that I was doing at that time. Um, uh, but again, we were on uh, on the East Coast. Um, Pretty much that's my whole career starting off other than uh, when I lived up in Seattle, Washington uh, for my undergraduate degree. Um, I joined the, the USCIS uh, initially uh, on, a, on one of those, I saw an opportunity, we wanted to get back to the West Coast. And, uh, and it, it was just something that I had, of course, I knew of the, uh, of the agency, even though it had shifted from the Immigration Naturalization Services to USCIS now. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in the 2000s, um, when DHS was implemented. But um, uh, I joined as a, initially as a supervisor, and I was again, I was not in the HR field at all whatsoever. Now, granted, uh, in my progressive uh, tours as a, as an officer, I did you know, military HR, but it was it was really um, just the, the the folks that were attached uh, either under me or you know and, and things like that. So it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily too much in depth and, and or to the level of expertise that our, uh, the other two panel members had. Uh, however, once I, I got here, I started, I, I went back to take some classes on HR and, uh, and then the human resources, um, uh, focusing on employee services and, and mission support areas. A lot of them were, um, were again, locally through my agency and or uh, and DHS. And I started getting an interest in, in this uh, to the point that I um, promoted to section chief uh, from being a supervisor. And then uh, a year later, uh, the opportunity presented itself where I could come in and lead uh, the human resources and, uh, and uh, employee services uh, mission support functions for the California Service Center as an associate center director. Um, here at the California Service Center, we, uh, uh, we take in petitions, so I'll give you a, a quick example. Let's say uh, you have a, a, a relative uh, in, in some other country that, uh, you, you know, you, they want to come to the United States, so they would go to the local embassy, so file in the paperwork, uh, depending on the form type and the benefit that they're seeking, and they will uh, submit their paperwork. Well, we take that paperwork they, they submit with all the original documentation. We uh, intake it and turn it digital, and then it goes through a series of adjudication processes where we validate, of course, that all the documents are, are, are valid. Um, uh, and, uh, and then we basically uh, give an adjudication decision on whether basically this individual checks all the boxes uh, on the requirements to, to obtain that benefit. And that benefit can be anything from a visa, uh, working visa to, um, um, you know, in, at least initially, to a resident status uh, uh, card, uh, you know, quote unquote, the infamous green card that you hear about in, in layman's terms. So we have about 1,800 federal employees that do this adjudication. Our workforce is comprised about, it's about a 50-50 mix of, of, of folks with uh, law degrees 
And I would say out of the other 50 that do not have law degrees, they all have about 37% have master's degrees, and then the rest have a bachelor's degree. So highly educated force, uh, much like yourselves, uh, folks, that we, uh, we definitely uh, do some, uh, some of the targeting on some of our recruitment. So bringing it back to what I do, so I oversee not only the HR and the employee services, i.e. benefits, retirements, and things like that, uh, that have already been covered, but we also, I also oversee the security, the payroll, which is uh, payroll and operating budget, which uh, is at about $250 million uh, for just for our service center alone. Uh, we also have 500 contracted employees that uh, I, I serve as a contract uh, officer representative to ensure that all the, uh, of, of course, they all the, um, uh, the uh, job series, all the statements of work for that particular contract are met. And I oversee, I, I, we're also a multi-tenant federal building here in Laguna Niguel. It's called the Ziggurat. It's a very interesting building. I might one by here, it can be seen from space and it's in the form of a pyramid built onto a mountain. Uh, in this building, we, uh, there's, there's other, uh, 12 other federal agencies, of which we are by far the largest, as I mentioned, with 1,800 feds and uh, about 500 contractors. So by de facto, I provide the overall security posture for the entire facility, the entire building. So I oversee a lot of other things uh, besides the HR. Uh, but bringing it back to the HR, and uh, what the previous panel mentioned, it is my, my, my job and you know, my section chiefs and my supervisors that, that work under me to handle everything from the uh, staffing decisions of uh, what we need based on workload. Uh, we do all the recruitment, do all the staffing, uh, what wants to get them on board. Uh, we hire, uh, we will be hiring folks and then we, we support them, as I mentioned, with anything that is human uh, uh, HR related or employee services related. Uh, here within uh, within our facility, uh, we do uh, do a lot of uh, uh, public job notice uh, announcements uh, where we bring in new folks, uh, and we also do very directed and or focused direct hiring authority that we uh, request for to bring in people at a little bit of a higher pay scale uh, right out of college. And um, so um, we are we pride ourselves in not only being able to bring vets. Uh, in under those public job announcements, but also when we need to also go hit some of the local universities and colleges, uh, we, we ask for uh, a special hiring authority that allows us to uh, sort of bypass the, the vets, right, because we already got a good grab of them uh, and bring in uh, targeted folks with, uh, with uh, um, you know, uh, advanced degrees, um, you know, we've, uh, as I mentioned, from either masters and or some uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, with law degrees. So, um, so again, uh, closing it up, it, it is a true pleasure and honor for me to basically go full circle that I, I, I came into this amazing uh, con uh, nation of ours, uh, uh, you know, through this uh, service, right, this agency, at the time INS, and now I'm an Associate Director for U.S. Citizens and Immigration Services, and while I, I am not an adjudicator, meaning I don't touch those forms, uh, I definitely support the, the workforce that does and that continues to expand the, the, the American dream to so many people from around the world that just want to come to, to, to realize it. So again, my honor and pleasure. And uh, uh, unless there's any questions, uh, hopefully that uh, gives a good summary of uh, where I'm from and what I do here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cervantes, you know, for the inspiring story, your personal story, and walking us through that. Um, kind of your, your career journey, you know, starting out not in HR, really, you know, make, making your way there. I think it's great for students to see the contrast because as I've spent time with lots of professionals, there's some who just kind of wander in and end up in HR at the end of the career. Some who know what they want to do right away. Some who come in, go in and go out. So I think it's very helpful. For, for the, the next part, I um, want to try to, to go a little bit faster and uh, snappier with, with shorter answers just to um, provide what I think is really valuable for students looking at any career. One thing I'm a big believer in is a realistic job preview. Now, the best way to do that is to do job shadowing or do an internship, but that that's not hard. I think the next best thing is to be able to sit down and have a, a good conversation with experts in that role. So, so with that in mind, um, I'll, I'll go start with you, um, Hector. 
and uh, and kind of go wrap wrap through alphabetically with a, a sentence reaction to what is uh, one of the the best things or most exciting things about uh, a role you've held in human resources. So let's let's start with the good. Sure. Um, thank you. I think again, I'll be short. Uh, so the best thing is, is again, bringing in uh, everything, uh, as I mentioned towards the end of uh, uh, f fellow fo uh, service members that have uh, moved on, with, uh, the majority have retired and are ready for a second career, and they want to continue, continue in the public service, uh, not in uniform. So that's always a great pleasure to have. But uh, one of the things that, that truly uh, we get a, a big bang for our bucks uh, based on, on some of our feedback reviews is when we go out to the colleges and, and get some inspiring young, young uh, men and women that want to join the public service, knowing that potentially there's there may be more money out in, in the public sector. Uh, but here, at least you get that extra thing of, of again, uh, realizing the American dream for, for somebody that's trying to come to, to, to our country. So. Uh, that nothing, in my in my view, nothing uh, uh, tops that, uh, you know, public service and again expanding or being part of the of the process, uh, you know, to for uh, immigrants to realize their American dream. So, so, um, so for HR, then what I'm hearing is is that it's uh, you really like the college recruiting. That that part is is fun because you you have an agency you, you truly. Uh, you know, no does important work for our country and, and making people like students in this audience aware of that. Is that, is that a fair fair sense of uh, one of the totally. things about HR you like best? Definitely, definitely. And, and you know, going out to the universities and, and telling uh, our, our mission set and, and what's in it and, and, uh, and, and some of the things that we would offer right from the benefits and, and, uh, and a career for them. Perfect. Uh, and, and then, um, you know, sentence or two, um, Dr. Tournay, what, what is uh, one of the best things about one of the roles you've held in HR? And, and then we'll be going to Edward Kona next. Dr. Tournay. All right. So that's kind of hard. It's just one <laughs> best thing, but I, I think I'll, I'll do like a couple, but I'll be fast. Um, I think that some of, of um, the programs really that for HR is celebrating um, the service recognition, you know, for our employees and the excellent work that they are doing, whether for staff or faculty, and, and really recognizing all those efforts that it feeds into student success. And also in HR, and I know Dr. Norman, you know that, you know, I get a pleasure of organizing the job shadow program where um, students get to actually um, shadow some of our managers and leaders here at the chancellor's office. So that's one of my favorite things as part of HR is really giving that window an opportunity and um, creating internships for students. So uh, celebrating um, the great work of, of our employees. And I think that creating that pipeline and um, growing the next leaders um, from, from our um, university. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. McKenna. Thank you, Dr. Norman. I think two things real quickly. Number one, I like the fact that HR can be part of the cradle to grave experience of employees. Uh, I've seen both military and civilian come in as infants. They come in as little babies, and I've seen them progress to where they become senior executives and major leaders. So that's very proud for me to see them and maybe have a little bit of in their success. The second thing is we HR are attuned to the changes in society. So if a societal change occurs, be it affinity orientation or other breakthroughs, we inevitably have to implement that. And I love being part of that, being able to see the change in the world, change in our country, and having to make that happen in the workplace. Wonderful. Um, I, I'll just kind of share my, my sense, too. The reason why I'm drawn to that is I've always noticed in organizations, what really makes organizations great, you know, is the people. But I don't always feel leadership teams, CFO, CEOs, you know, recognize that. They'll say people are their greatest asset, but they really live it. And, and I often share students examples of teams. You can see it very, very easily in athletic teams when uh, you've got the right direction, the right talent, and people are working together. You can, you can see the success. It can be harder to see how that works in each of our roles um, because we don't have a score, right? We, there's not a, a, a clock that ends and we can see how many points we have. Sometimes people use dollars for that, but really it's about impact and serving the world, which is why you know, I, I really enjoy working with these government panels because you can't just say, oh, we're doing best because we, we sell the most things right now. I, I think that's, that's very short-sighted. So I wanna stay positive, but I will be coming around just so you can be thinking about what's the worst thing about HR, right? The HR is a, is a profession, as you know, where we get uh, made fun of a bit. You've got Catbert, 
We have Toby on the office, um, you know, like examples of the evil HR, the, the incompetent HR personality. So, but, but I want to stay positive because I, I do know and believe, um, and then there are CEOs out there like, you know, Jack Welch, Lionize, you know, HR knew, knew that what we're, um, this profession is, is so important for a great organization, you know, for keeping our country safe, for educating future minds. So there, there's what you like best and, and we'll, we'll stay on, on you if it's okay. Um, and then wrap through uh, Joan and, and back. What do you think is the most impactful, right? So there's what, what I like to do, but then there's the thing that I may or may not like to do. There might be, be a synergy, but what, where do you see HR really impacting the organizations you serve in a way that might not be appreciated, but um, you know, it's something also for students who, who maybe have that role and move on to something else that they could articulate saying, you know, this is where I made a difference. Because that's the other thing I, I teach as I try to become executives, what impact you have. If you can articulate that well and you can make an impact, your value um, tends to be recognized and, and you'll see yourself moving up if that's a goal you have. And any thoughts on that? Uh, and we'll start, start with you, Edward. So one of the things that I, I, I hated the most in my career is when we started downsizing people. And it's different from employee relations where you work through progressive discipline and by the time someone gets fired, they've got it coming, so to speak. We're not hitting them just on the first infraction. And so going into places where they were gonna lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And I think of a place called Louisville, Kentucky when I went in there and the people were distrustful of management, but because I stood up and I thought I had integrity and we supported them, they came to trust HR more than they trusted the command. And we found a way to place everyone in jobs. Even though they closed that place and it was very sad, we were able to keep them employed. And those who could retire, we were able to get them early retirements. So no, no great scorecard, it's kind of sad, but I thought we were able to make a difference in the people's life, even though they had a very harsh outcome that was gonna happen. So I think that really kind of stands out to me. Not something I'm always the most proud of, but nobody left Louisville without a job. We've got them all placed or we got them a pension. So that's kind of my lead off, sir. That, no, that, that's fantastic, right? These, these are the stories I want people to know because everybody there that got the job is grateful, right? And it doesn't always get recognized, may not show up in the, the bottom line. Uh, so Dr. Tournay, um, some, an aspect of HR where you've seen you've really made an impact, you know, one of the universities you serve. Yeah, I think that I um, wanted to also um, follow along with being part of layoff and downsizing for the first time in history. I was at San Jose State when we have to do that. And it was a very uh, difficult, um, stressful process as with our union contracts, it's by seniority points. And uh, we have to create that calculator and work with the chancellor's office at that time to ensure it's accurate because we've never done layoffs in the history of CSU at that um, e economic downturn around uh, 2007, 2008, around that time. So I, I think um, following up on that, um, you know, it's really impacting of making it ensuring it's accurate, that you got the right people that needs to go on each bucket of bumping or a retirement or having that pension and have those options. And the accuracy of the data is really, really important and working with our team and putting in all the hours because we wanted to ensure that you're impacting people's lives and it better be the right message. You know, we don't want to be in a position where um, you are issuing a layoff and then you're retracting it. You know, you are impacting um, people's lives as soon as you identify um, those um, names and the work that you have to do behind the scenes for that. Okay, thank you. And then Mr. Cervantes. Yes, sir. So a very similar story. We, we have, uh, we went a few years, two and a half years ago. Uh, we are a fee-based company. Basically, when those benefit requests come, petitions come in, they come in with a check. So we're able to cover ourselves and we have a very small appropriated uh, funding string uh, for the agency. But that being said, uh, about two and a half years ago, we went through what it was called a furlough where we basically were a little bit in the red and we wanted to basically balance ourselves out and bring us into, into the black. And uh, through that exercise, similar to the, the stories that, that just were just shared, uh, we had to basically run the entire um, uh, workforce, the entire agency, about 18, as I mentioned, 18,000 plus, through uh, a process where we would identify who had the seniority and or the tenure 
to stay behind. And, uh, and, and again, uh, just going through that exercise and, 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 and putting folks with uh, under that uh, microscope that potentially they may not be senior enough to, to stay if that was to be executed. It was something that we had to do. Fortunately, uh, we were able to, um, uh, of course, that was just the, uh, the last resort. Uh, we we were able to come out of it doing other cost savings initiatives across the across the board uh, in, in our agency, and uh, we were able to um, uh, ask for we did ask for some of the volunteer workforce that were there uh, see if they wanted to retire. Uh, several jumped on that uh, that option and and and, and they moved on. Uh, they got a great pension to uh, to leave us with, uh, but again uh, we did put people through that stress uh, of, of not knowing. Uh, but again, it, at the end of the day, we were able to pull that back and we never were able to, had to execute it. So, uh, again, when you affect people's lives, it's, it's, it's so uh, uh, hurtful, uh, you know, to even have that conversation. Thank you. Yeah. And, and now I'll, I'll stay with you for, you know, still want to stay a little bit positive on the positive side of things. Um, is there a role in HR that you haven't done yet? Um, that, that you would like to do, right? Or, you know, if, if you were told you can't do what you're doing now, is there an area of human resources that, uh, you know, you'd really like to explore? And, and kind of the purpose for this question is for students who to see that it's, you know, it wouldn't be unlikely in five years that you might be doing something, you know, pretty different. And for them to, to get a sense of, um, you kind of want to get them to know you, each of you in the, as panelists, a little bit uh, the human side, and, and then, then I'll go to the, the next kind of theme of question. So anything that you would like to do or wish you might have done uh, in your career that, that just has intrigued you in the HR field? So uh, tons, tons of stuff. And, and, and of course, at some point, uh, like I tell my, my family, I would like to grow up and, and do something outside of, 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 of the service and, and, and try the civilian sector in this field, because I think it's, it's great. You're touching people's lives on on everything. And uh, so, uh, but one of the things that I, I'm very intrigued, at least is something that I don't oversee, which is kind of weird in my agency, is the classification process for job series. And that's from, uh, you know, from the moment of what is it that we're looking for, uh, skill sets and, and the like, uh, to, to classify a position and give it that, uh, that uh, the pay scale that it warrants and also the duties and responsibilities that fall within. That is something that it gets, um, uh, I've only seen them at work as one of those folks, you know, I, I call them the folks that we keep behind the, behind the curtain that do all the behind the scenes things. And again, just because they don't, I don't have those under my uh, overview, uh, my purview right now. Well, I don't have them, uh, they work at, at our headquarters. Uh, I don't get to see that aspect of it. I just know, I see their results and, and some of the decisions. So I'd like to learn a little bit more, but again, uh, there's so much in this field that, I mean, I can't even begin oh, but that, to- That's a great uh, example, right? And, and as somebody who teaches, you know, this, uh, teaches classification for the students, uh, they'll see that in the intro class, they might take a staffing class where they actually, you know, practice, you know, doing that. Um, everybody really has to implement it, right? But not everybody gets to actually work on the design or the redesign. And, and that's one of the things I think the government sector is probably finding in the private sector. Sometimes those job descriptions have to change, you know, almost <laughs> quarterly, um, you know, and, and uh, keeping pace um, in that they might have a point-based system, you know, might be more flexible. Government agencies tend to have this classification system. So, so really, really good example. How about Dr. Tornay? Is there a field in HR you've always said, oh, you know, I'd like to do that, or maybe it's one that you wouldn't do now because of your level, but you're like, oh, I kind of wish I would have done that when I was 23. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, actually, for classification and compensation, I got to redo, uh, be part of a team at Santa Clara University. It was a private university where we got to redo the classification compensation. I know in a public, it's already created and there's like few changes. Like you said, it's classification salary schedules are already built in and you just have to use that and execute and um, do a reference. So I think for... Um, areas of HR that I you know really would like to do that I haven't done a lot and probably will do in the future would be probably focused more on um, coaching um, and I know that you know I don't do that a lot because we were giving guidance as HR professionals and HR administrators um, but I would love to do more coaching in the future I think maybe that's when I retire in the future and do some executive coaching or coach students on their career I think that would be something that I'd be interested to do that I haven't done. 
Okay, fantastic. And then Mr. Vicuna, uh, what, what might you want to uh, try that you haven't yet done? So I've been blessed be and, and being older has its blessings. Uh, I've been able to work in all the major functions, have experience in them and be, be part of a lot of transformational initiatives like demonstration projects and pay banding. I think where I am at in my stage of my life, the next, what I would really like to do is to work on the knowledge transfer that I have and others have and work to the development of the next generation of HR professionals in the Department of Navy and in the federal government, because we're all really one big company, the federal government. I like to brag the Department of Navy is huge. We got plus 30,000 employees in California, but we're all the federal government and it takes a lot of investment in the generation of HR professionals. So it's just like I was a kid back in the 1980s out of UCSB, they invested in me. And that lasted, many of us lasted 30 some years. So I think that's the great need. And maybe to get into that, to work with the, the young people or the new professionals coming into our field and help develop them for success. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, something to do in the future to work on that almost exclusively would almost be like a vacation. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's the type of perfect job, right? Where you almost don't need to get paid for it. So uh, one wonderful answer, very inspiring. It really fits with this whole government to university initiative, right? The, uh, that's the core uh, of hoping that we're inspiring, you know, one or two in the audience right now, and uh, hopefully dozens of those who will watch this later, because I know the videos are about 10 times on the, on the YouTube, uh, that you'll really, uh, you know, think about that and then hear something today. And that's the spirit in which I ask this question and, and I'll, I'll go with you first. And it's, it's good that we're on you, Mr. Vicuna, because you've done everything, right? So again, in the realistic job preview, I want students to realize just because panelists doesn't like something, uh, you know, doesn't mean that, it, that it's bad, but um, everybody here, you know, and myself included, there's aspects that I like better uh, than others. And there might be some that we're competent at that, that we do to move up. So for example, I'm very, you know, talented and tell my students accounting is important. Uh, being able to do compensations offer often a higher paid HR skill. But for me, it might not be as exciting as, as coaching or, you know, hands-on working, um, you know, seeing things. So, you know, that'd be kind of the way I might, might say I wouldn't want to do compensation or benefit work for an extended period of time, you know, even though I have an ability and I was willing to pay my dues. You know, with, with that in mind, uh, could you share with, with our group, Mr. Bakuna, what, what's an area of HR that you've done that um, wasn't your favorite, right? For, for whatever reason, just to help get that insight that they might not get from a book or, you know, uh, doing something in a class, because you can be good at something, but you still might not love it. So one of the things that was very, very difficult for me, um, as an HR professional, we, we learned our HR functions, right? We knew our functions, but then we had to interact with our line organizations. And, and in my career, I worked with a lot of scientists and engineers, blue collar. So they were different types of skills. Some of them were easy to work with, but some of my, my, some of my higher educated engineers and scientists, they were really difficult. I mean, they would, they would triple, triple second guess you, right? They would question your, your logic. They would question why we have to do it. It's you're a horrible staff function. You're worthless. So you'd have to go into a den of lions and you would have to go in and defend your function, speak up and become attuned to the organizational language, right? Of our serviced organizations. Because HR doesn't live just for itself. We have to meet the mission of our organizations. So that was very hard to go in there. And I felt like take a lot of guff from them but in a way, it was a rite of initiation that I didn't appreciate. Right? They were inducting me into their organization. Now, sometimes their behavior needed to be corrected, but otherwise it was about me learning their vernacular, learning what was important to them, and then finding a way to make a difference. It isn't always the book answer that they want to hear, right? And sometimes it doesn't work. So you have to make sure you're keen to learn what's important to them and to adjust so that they, they respect you and give you a seat at the table. So that was a little bit of a challenge for me, and I didn't like it at first, sir. A per perfect exam answer, right? You know, there's some folks who think they like labor relations, but if they don't like the conflict, that's probably not the area to be because it, it's by its nature adversarial. All right, Dr. Tornay. Uh, for me, I would, I would say payroll. So, because uh, in organizations, um, uh, sometimes it's in HR or sometimes it's in finance or it's in accounting. So I've been in um, two organizations where 
one's in HR and the other one's in accounting. And so when it was HR, I was overseeing it. You know, all, all the rules and regulations of taxes and the numbers, I was able to do it, but it's not something that I'm like, oh, you know, I love doing it. So I know that, you know, we need that. You know, we need those accurate paychecks and they need to be on time, but it's something that I've done, but it's not something that I love doing um, as part of, of HR. Perfect. Thank you. And Mr. Cervantes, one of, one of the areas of HR, it's not, not your number one. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow a suit on the payroll and the, or the time in attendance. Uh, uh, definitely, you know, life happens to a lot of our folks where they have to take the discretionary leave and, and in some cases uh, uh, leave without pay. And, and of course, uh, uh, you, you have to go in and, 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 and dot your, your eyes and cross your T's to ensure that everything's done, but more importantly, ensure why, uh, to, uh, that the employee understands why some of those uh, uh, aspects affect their, their payroll, uh, you know, uh, when circumstances occur in, in their life. So, uh, you know, the following suit to um, what the last panel has mentioned, uh, I would say that's the hardest part. Okay, that's very good. Um, the next direction I'd like to go is um, HR, as you just said, uh, you know, it, it is a support, you know, group and, and serves managers, you know, and as you move up, it becomes often a larger part of your job. For some specialists, it isn't, but for, for each of you, you, your stories have already, you know, show that that's important and, and that can be a source of, of frustration. Um, you know, what, what advice do you have for those in the room that are like, you know what, probably not going to do human resource management, but I'm going to do a management role where I need to work with human resource management. Or maybe at this point, because I found this, they don't even know how much easier their job is that they work effectively with HR. You know, this, that's the notion of a strategic partner. Your examples of what two of you didn't like is kind of the transactional, right? Just kind of doing it, but it's not the transformational HR that we now talk about in our undergraduate and our graduate program. So, um, you know, Mr. Cervantes, could you uh, offer some advice for those in the room that, that, that might not end up in HR right away, um, but, but how do you find, um, or, you know, what would you encourage managers to know or how should they act to really utilize the, the benefit that, that you can bring to them personally in their growth, as well as for the organization, right? You know, and, and I love this analogy of the federal government being one big, you know, employer, um, you know, to, to serve the federal government, the state of California, what, whatever um, government unit it is you're supporting. Yeah, so no problem. So I think it all it rolls back to know that every individual case and every is it's a special case that you're going to deal with. Uh, you know, you don't know all the uh, influences that are happening with that employer uh, when they come to you with with a gripe or or something. So you got to be able to uh, empathize, uh, listen uh, to what it is that they're they're seeking, and 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 be ready to give them an answer that again. Uh, it should always fall within the policy and the reason why you're, you're explaining that. So, so just know that at the end of the day, we're, we're all humans. Nobody, nobody's perfect, and, and mistakes are done on both ends. So, you know, sometimes you may not uh, be able to fully uh, help them out, but you try your best uh, so, to, so that at least when they leave uh, your office or, or you, you end that conversation, they, they have a full understanding of, of why, it, why it is that, uh, that you may not be able to help them to, to their full satisfaction. Um, hope that Wonderful. answers. And in your thoughts, Dr. Thanks. Tornay. I think um, probably would, would like to add on that for um, folks that are not going to be in HR, but going to be in management. I mean, you're going to be dealing with people, whether you're in HR or not, and um, you'll hear this word politics. Like I think someone with a political science major here, but you know, politics equals people. You know, it, it's about navigating the different personalities, the different uh, situations that, that you're presented. and. Um, partner with your HR um, folks, you know, yes, they know the policies, they, they know um, what you can, cannot do, but they're there to partner with you to be creative and think outside the box. It, it might be a no because of certain policies, but know that HR professionals, we're here to partner with managers and serve the employees. We, we wear all those hats, right, and represent the organization. So if you don't end up in HR, um, please, uh, you know, partner with your HR uh, department and individuals that you could seek and, and be open to new perspectives on, on, on management. All right, thank you. Uh, how about Mr. Bakuna? I've seen 
as I went through my career that the really savvy managers, they knew that they had to have relations with the HR professionals. So the real successful ones, they knew who the staffer was. They knew who the head of classification was, employee relations. We also had managers who seemed to want to be at war with us. They hated us. They hated our rules. They didn't like that we didn't let them do what they needed to do. I guess my advice to managers is that when you find your good HR person, invest in them, trust in them. I don't try to own them or adjudicate their, their policy interpretations. If they're, they, will be, they will be there to support you. And a key thing for a manager is that to make sure you give us our voice. Uh, we're there to help you. So if we're telling you something's wrong, we're not trying to keep you from doing something. We're there to be your, your reinforcer. We've got your back is what we like to tell them. But you've got to accept our dissent. It's not just when we tell you stuff that you like, but sometimes we've got to tell you stuff that will only benefit you and the command may be contrary from your first instincts. I think in terms of managers who get mad at employees and they do stuff that can be construed as reprisal or hostile or get us into lots of difficulty that we really don't need to just because they have an impulse. Over. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, the, the, the way I, reason I ask that question is the way I frame a management job is anyone who's managing people, whether they <laughs> accept this or not, I know they are doing human resource management, right? They're managing people. So I've been in organizations where a lot of the HR activities are all embedded in the manager. And, and it was a very high performing organization. It was in the private sector. It was Procter and Gamble. And, uh, you know, managers doing a lot of the selection, a lot of the attraction, a lot of the training, the performance management, you know, HR might set the salary schedule, but they were advocating that there's a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, and then I could go to more, think of examples in more structured, you know, like, like the Cal State system. And, uh, you know, they, they still are doing human resource management. It might be more constrained and more of it might be outsourced to HR professionals. So that, that's um, advice, I, at least I would offer, you know, why fight yourself? If you have somebody who's going to help you do something, plus for many managers, if you, you might realize I don't have uh, all the time in the world, why not use my trusted partner, um, you know, whether it's Dr. Tournay or Mr. Cervantes, um, you know, or, uh, or, or, you know, Mr. Vicuna, uh, you know, to, to offload. And, and this, this comes with trust. And, and you know, so, so what I'd like um, you to take up is this the sense of, of relationship building. Do you think the HR of today, you know, that, that these soft skills, these learning to partner uh, would serve students well as they're going in if they have that, that mindset and attitude that it's not just about knowing your area, knowing training theory, knowing compensation theory, but it's going to be just as important to reach out and build credibility, build trust, build relationships with other members of the, the team, that that's going to serve them well. Uh, you know, would you agree with that? And, it, and is there something you could elaborate to say yes? And you know, here's where I've seen it work or you know, feel free to disagree with the professor too. And, and we'll, we'll start with you. That's okay, I think you hit it right on the on the mark there, Dr. Norman. I think an HR professional has to be the ultimate competent. Uh, at the senior levels, we 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 we're informed, you know, of, of the discipline of the promotion of people more senior than us, right? But we have to keep that in confidence. If we're practitioners and we're conducting discipline actions or other things, we're not going to blab that. We have to keep that quiet, right? And even as employees employees come to us either with they're going through divorces or personal issues those are things of confidence that we have to keep so knowing those interpersonal skills learning tact diplomacy learning how to give give news a bedside manner you can tell someone they're losing the job and appear to enjoy the news you're giving them and they will resent that and if you can show some empathy and some compassion i think that goes a long way a part of hr though is being able to stand up and defend yourself against managers or others who are questioning your advisory service, question your interpretation of the advice and standing tall there and, and with respect, showing professionalism. I think that grant gains a lot of credibility. So I hope that that helps, sir. I, well, I love the way you say that, right? I, I, I think that's so true as you go up the ranks, right? You know, sometimes you have to be like a lamb. You know, you need to be trusting and you have that role of, of listening. You know, a coach is going to be supportive. And sometimes you got to be a lion. You have to tell the honest truth. Uh, you, you have a mission. So, so I, I, I think that's a great answer. Um, Dr. Tournay, what, could you riff on this and, and keep kind of this conversation going? Uh, yeah. Agree, disagree with my premise. 
Yeah, I know. I definitely agree. And I just the thing that I wanted um, to add is, you know, there are times when we're in a situation where, you know, um, with leadership or management, it's like, oh, you know, just do what they're going, what they're recommending, because we're going to get overwritten anyways, just like what um, Mr. Vicuno was saying, but to stand true and ensure that this is our recommendation. And this is the reason why and I'd always put it and uh, documented that this is our recommendation, but also respect the, the roles and the leadership because there may be things as an HR professional that I may not know. Yes, we know a lot of the different, but there could be things and I have to respect the decision of the leader of why they're making a different decision than what I'm recommending because ultimately they are responsible for that decision. But as an HR professional, I have to own my job and inform and advise what is needed based on the knowledge and information that I have. So I think yes to partner, but also to, to really um, understand that relationship and um, know that, you know, we all have our roles and um, that that's where it's going to take you is that relationship building as, as you noted, uh, Dr. Norman. And I think you raise a good point for the audience. I really want to highlight um, that you know, HR isn't the deciding, is, isn't the manager in charge, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. an, it's an advocate. Uh, and that reminds me of working with engineers, uh, computer scientists in a rapidly growing company. This is Silicon Valley. And um, sometimes the weak managers and wanting to blame HR. Oh no, um, Dr. Torday told me I had to do this. And that's never true, right? It, you know, HR is not mm -hmm. running the division, the department. It's the manager, and they maybe consulted advice and said this would be good. But um, you know, so that that's uh, an area I want students to realize too. Not not to abuse HR that way, right? You know, part of it's that courage that as as you're a manager and a leader, um, we we need to to own decisions, right, and, and understand the roles. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, and then to continue the conversation, Mr. Cervantes, any, you know, anything that jumps out for you, anything you want to challenge, disagree with, or, or elaborate on? Uh, no, sorry, hundred percent agree with everything that's been said. And, and there's uh, one practice that I, I put in with, with my teams and that's professionalism at all times where your customer service, our, our employees, our workforce, our customers first, first and foremost, and we're here to, to assist them. So uh, to professionalism and respect uh, to Mr. Kuna's point, sometimes you have to deliver bad news, uh, both up and down the chain. And then last but not least, transparency and communication. Again, you know, if there's something that uh, that a policy does not allow us to, to go there and, and it's not in favor of the employee or, or the recommendation uh, that we're submitting up, uh, um, you know, uh, we, we've got to be able to back it up with something in, in black and white, right? Some kind of doctrine or, or directive that uh, prevents us from, from going in that direction. And, and it all equates to trust, right? If, if you do those, you're transparent, you, uh, you have open communications, uh, um, you, you're a professional and you respect the individual. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that gives uh, that shop, you know, for lack of a better term, that HR team, uh, the, the trust for employees to come in and, and, and basically trust what we tell them, what we give them as a recommendation. And hopefully they know that it's never a personal thing. It's, it's uh, we're just uh, trying to, you know, do our jobs as, as best as we can. Great answer, you know, and, and, and your comments and some of the other comments also made me recall one of the main differences people I've known who've moved into HR felt how, how they're treated differently, and it would come at the, the cafeteria or the lunch table. I'm wondering if any of you have had this experience where, because you, there, there is a confidentiality, right? You, <clears throat> HR has a lot of things you suddenly can't talk about, and you'll know a lot of things you won't know, and uh, maybe in your other role, you're able to be freer. Um, have any of you had that experience where, you know, um, people don't want to sit at your table? Like, oh, you know, I don't want to sit there because HR is going to hear, or, um, you know, you, you found that uh, you know that the confidential role make, makes the relationship a little bit different, and it, it might might be a little bit strange for some colleagues to uh, uh, you know to make that adjustment. I don't know. I, I, I'd seen that. Have any of you seen that? I'll just kind of let you um, unmic yourself because that's a quick answer. You, you've seen that, or you, or you have it. No, that's all. I, this is sector. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen that aspect. Of, you know, because you know, I told my folks we're privileged to to be. Uh, to, to have uh, to see some of the things that, that are happening behind the scenes, right? Good, bad, and, and sometimes ugly, unfortunately. Uh, but what I've seen is mostly people come to my folks, at, at least the, you know, around the water cooler, right? And, and, and they want to hear what's the latest. When are we going to hire? You know, hey, what's going on with this? What's going on with that? Uh, not so much. Uh, they you know run away from us because they, they think oh, HRC here and they're going to go turn me in. Uh, so that's been my experience. Thank you. That's good. 
Good. Anyone else want to jump in? Okay. Um, my, my next. I've had experience. I've had experience. Yeah, please. I'm sorry, real quickly. The ones that I've I've seen the the behavior from are usually the senior managers. The rec and file seem to want to ask us questions. <laughs> the senior managers are the ones who are paranoid. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. And I appreciate um, you know the honesty, the reflection here. So so now as an educator, um, I'm going to ask uh, from two different levels um to help help those students who are, are now saying yeah i think hr is something i want to do and i think i can see a career in government possibly so could you think back to your undergraduate program and uh could be dr norman i think you froze let's see if he will recover sorry about that hopefully he'll um i'll write back in you know i may be having some computer reboot issues too so if i get thrown off um, that will be the reason, but again, I think the, the panel has been given a lot of great information to our students, uh, potential students. We're in a very great field that can serve many enterprises. So I think he was going towards what your undergraduate education might have helped you. And I know that going through community college and UC helped me research and to write. And those were skills that really carried me through my 30 some years. So all of, a lot of things I get done today are because I was a student. And I learned those things, uh, that stu that classwork, being on point, having good relations with your classmates and with your professors. Uh, that, that was something that I, that I carried with me even to this day. So I think that's where he might have been going. I'm not sure. So we never stop being students. We're always learning and every, at every opportunity and every position that we have, we're learning something that we can carry on with us to our next position or wherever we need to use that information. I think being lifelong yeah. learning and then also learning from, from our subordinates, learning from our kids, because we don't know everything. And sometimes because we think we know everything because we're older, it's, we're proven wrong. So we have to humble ourselves even as we become experts in things, because there's always going to be something we don't quite capture. <clears throat> right. And I think that's too, because ex each experience may be different different employees, you're going to encounter different issues. So you're always, that makes you always be in a learning state because you're going to run into a situation. Oh, I've never faced this before. What do I do here? Or, oh, I just dealt with that. Now I can use the same strategy to help this employee. Do you have anything to add, yeah. Dr. Renee? Yeah, um, no, thank you um, for that. But I think that going back to um, my undergrad, um, and then maybe my maybe going over how did I end up in HR? Um, you've heard me say that uh, my bachelor's in international business. So my fourth year, because um, that's a time when you actually get to take your um, higher division classes, right, in your major. And I just realized at time, because I was minoring in sociology, and I'm like, I can't do international business because my interpretation at that time, and it's not, you know, the right interpretation, but my interpretation at that time is that as an international business um, person, I will be going to different countries and um, taking advantage of the resources of uh, making money and then moving on to another country. And that's my interpretation is with my minor in social. I'm like, I can't do that job. And so I'm in my senior year and I'm like, what, what can I do? I can't switch majors anymore. I've switched so many times and, and it's okay for all of you. I started as psychology, then sociology, and then international business. And third time, it's still not a charm, um, but I had to finish you know, that degree, but I went to Career Center and please, please, please utilize the resources in your university. I went to Career Center, um, talked to the director, said, hey, Joan, have you heard of HR? And it's like, no. Um, well, it seems like when you talk about what you like to do, it's more about helping people. You like to advocate for people's rights, their benefits. Um, you know, we're going to put you to a job shadow program and you can uh, go downtown San Francisco and shadow a vice president of HR at that time. And I did it for a week and I fell in love with HR. And that's how After I ended up week. in HR. <laughs> that's how I ended up in HR. And um, I got a, a certificate in HR from San Jose State. I was going to San, 
uh, USF at that time, but I was advised by the vice president saying, since you're not going to have a degree in HR, go get a certificate on top of finishing your bachelor's. If you can invest on that, that would help you a long way. And um, that certificate in HR has an, had given me all the barriers of HR have helped me in that. Open path. doors for you. Open doors um, <laughs> for me. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Yes. So that's wanted to just um, um, share that because that's even um, pre my master's and pre going into my first HR job that um, I did a job shadow downtown San Francisco and that's where I found HR is my career so well we're glad to have Dr. Norman back on yeah. here yeah, my, my apologies my uh, spectrum went out and uh, luckily I was able to get on a mobile so um, it looks like we're still talking about the educational question I, I hope you heard and I, I'm happy to hear Dr. Tornay talking about uh, certifications because I wanted to go um, for, for both. And I'll, I'll watch the video to see which college classes um, the panelists liked best. Uh, the, uh, on that same theme, another thing I advocate our students do, uh, we now call this service learning, I, I just called it volunteering when I was in college, was finding activities that'll help you develop skills for that career you want. And I think this is so useful for human resources because there's learning what to do and then there's actually practicing it. Whether you're a student leader, just a student member, you can learn um, you know, about project management. You can learn about uh, building teams. Uh, you, you can learn about the importance of checking to see for an event. You know, will will um, people be coming enough time to set up, right? So there, there's a lot of skills that could translate well from volunteering activities, whether it's a church, um, you know, a nonprofit, a school organization. And so maybe beginning with uh, Mr. Cervantes, um, you know, either in your experience or people you've worked with, what types of volunteer activities might our audience um, engage in that would, would help them develop skills that you found important for you in the HR profession? Yes, uh, thank you. So um, I really, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can truly answer because I've, uh, I know that I've joined uh, some several associations, uh, and a lot of my folks are pursuing their uh, HR professional certifications within within the federal government. Uh, but you're 100% correct. Uh, you know, and going back to Mr. Osuna, the, the uh, thing about li life learning, right? A, a lot of the times, it's just about learning how to deal with the the multi generations that we're seeing in the workplace. You know, just the thing that tune with that. So, unfortunately, I don't think I can truly answer um, something that I, uh, a little better answer that I would feel. Oh, that, 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 that's right. okay. Um, Dr. Tornay. I think, um, I mean, for, for the CSU, for Chancellor's Office, um, here where we're at, I think I've mentioned we have a job shadow program. And so I think that's a really great window. Um, and it's not just for HR, but we also have um, IT and, and finance um, for that program. And we are starting an internship program as well for um, CSU students um, for, for us here at the Chancellor's Office. But I really encourage any leadership role that you could take on in your university in any organization really translate to any job and management job that you would get um, in the future and dealing with different personalities, conflicts, you know, those are very, very um, important um, skills that, you know, you learn through experience. You have to put yourself in those um, situations and then you learn as you grow. I think we, um, we mentioned about continuous learning, so it doesn't stop where when you get a job, sure, you'll get promotions here and there, but continue your learning through professional certifications or um, keeping um, SHRM, SCP, PHR, SPHR, I believe you've heard of those um, certifications where you have to complete um, CEUs to keep them every three years, so then um, it's not just about um, I'm attending or checking off a box or or um, being part of a new project or learning something new in HR, doing something new that that also um, qualifies for those certifications. And um, so I, I think there's a lot of opportunities um, at the university and outside um, at this point. So please, please, please take um, those up like service learning, volunteer, 
internship if you can as much as as, as you can or job shadowing program or even um um interviews uh, informational interviews get out there um learn as much as you can um and um, learn about the other careers and pathways and journeys of professionals and uh, mr vacuna i think he dropped off dr norman um oh. he, he was having issues well, maybe maybe we have the same service then. <laughs> okay, um, then then with our reduced panels, I'm going to ask ask you to think back to a job you you might have had. You know, if you worked in high school, if you worked in college at, at Cal State, you know, the majority of my students are working. You know, they have plenty of work experience, which I think makes it such a joy to teach teach at Cal State because it's easier to understand the HR concepts if you've had a job. It's, you know, a good manager you'd learn things, a bad manager. And uh, I have a lot of, of uh, students and, you know, my own experience, I think of um, serving customers. A lot of them work for restaurants. I, I used to work at a hot dog stand where I'd have to serve coffee, hot dogs. And, and I've learned a, um, the importance of having a professional demeanor, which you've, each of you have mentioned is important in HR, right? Trying to, to keep, keep your thoughts, um, you know, stay professional, stay calm, even when managers maybe aren't, aren't acting uh, particularly pleasantly or rationally, right? They're, they're, um, mad about something that, that maybe with more more reflection they wouldn't be and this definitely happens with customers those who've worked in that industry so that would be you know one example i'd give of a job that students might have already had that has useful um, experience that if they're interviewing for a position you know with the federal government at the state government they, they might want to say hey i already have some great examples in my interview to talk about how i've um you know developed uh, professionalism. So maybe then going to Mr. Cervantes, are there any jobs you've had or just in people you've worked with, you know, they've shared, oh yeah, this, this skill you maybe pick up, you know, in your teenage years, your early twenties, uh, really is indicative to being a, a good HR professional. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that, you know, the biggest thing that, that, uh, that stands out from, uh, you know, <laughs> my high school jobs, you know, to, to make sure I had guests for my for my pickup truck and down in Texas was, you know, you you had to be uh, punctual, right? You had to be uh, honest and, and and respectful, uh, you know, with with whatever it was that the, 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 you were doing. Whether it didn't matter whether you were, uh, uh, you know, selling fast food or, or or mowing yards or whatever, you know, it's it's people of value that exchange, right? That exchange that you're being respectful and professional. Uh, you know, uh, when, when you're dealing with that. Um, so those, those are some of the things that, that kind of stood out that I, I've always carried, as I mentioned, because it's, it's that impression that, that you give, right? People will, will always, uh, you know, that one of the biggest examples, you know, the, the Chick-fil-A uh, company, right? You know, my pleasure, you know, those little things are what people remember and, and they value, even though they probably don't even think about it twice subconsciously. I think there's something to be said about that. Uh, giving that uh, that exchange uh, with another individual um, something to 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 remember. Um, that's that's what I can share. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Tornay. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. You know, it, it brings me back to in high school. I actually uh, worked at um, Pretzel Maker and then at J.C. Penney's. And so uh, from high school, I think. Some of those things, like so, time management, prioritization. You know, it's um, about and and customer service, right? You you could translate that into what um, Hector is saying on um, professionalism, and um, there could be an irate customer out there, and you know, to never lose your temper, um, what either whatever level, whether that's my high school job or where I'm at now, and um, and I think to grow in a way that you have ways to de-escalate it or say you know looks like you're upset at this time we're going to have to reschedule um, a meeting and so on a customer service level you know you'd say okay i see that you're upset this is the information that i have i'm going to get my manager and probably would explain more but to never lose um your temper um prioritization, professionalism um, is um, always there. So I think there's so many things that could um, really translate to not just HR, but any job that you would um, have in the future. Excellent. All right, if um, the audience has any questions in the chat, uh, I've got one last question and uh, we're doing great for time. We have about 20 some minutes. 
Uh, so I want want the guests to uh, feel free to post those questions. And if I miss some because of my connection, I'm now back back in my regular setup. Um, please repost in the chat because the chat gets deleted when this happens. And what we're waiting for them, this, this is the part that we find people tend to fast forward to the most once they know it's on here. So what tips, what specific tips do you have for those individuals wanting to work for uh, your, your agency, your organization, the chancellor's office, or maybe Cal State in general, you know, Homeland Security, uh, the different, different areas where, where you've worked, what tips could you give them in the specific application process, right? How do they go about that to feel comfortable? I, you know, I think as managers, you don't want to trip people up. They're, we're not trying to, to, to fool them, right? But, but the selection process wants to weed out those that are the best fit. And sometimes I find um, you know, students or all of us can feel like an imposter, right? Because we're, we're moving to something we don't know, right? Do I deserve this? Is this going to be a fit? So in, in that spirit of being helpful, uh, you know, what, what advice do you have, uh, Dr. Tornay? You know, you shared a link, but sometimes for a student like, oh my gosh, what do I do next, right? That's just, you know, can you hold my hand a little bit more through the process and, and we can start, start with you. What, what advice do you have in applying to join the wonderful HR team at the Chancellor's Office of the California State University? Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Norman. And I, I think that in any job and then for um, the CSU, I think always start with what's your connection to the company? You know, it's not just a job because a job, there's so many jobs out there, right? So, but why is CSU? Why would you like to work for um, the CSU or a particular chancellor's office and human resources? So I think that um, that, that should come through your resume and definitely um, in the um, in the interview, but really dig deep and, and research about the organization, um, whether it's a CSU or with um, with Sir Cervantes um, Federal Organization, you know, really align with the mission, with the values, um, and um, really come through to that. Um, take time to to check the CSU careers. I mean, you could put HR there and, and look through all the various HR positions available in the CSU. It start with researching what are they looking for? You know, it's like you, you don't start looking when you need it. It takes preparation. So right now, check what they're looking for and work through those things that you can and aligning what you can do while you're finishing your degree. Um, that was one of my frustrations before is right after college, you know, it's like wanted to get an analyst job right away or an HR manager job. It's like, what? They need five, 10 years experience? I don't have that. I just graduated. So, you know, it's those expectations, be realistic, um, do what you need to do to gain experience. Um, entry level jobs are great, uh, sometimes being a temp, um, you know, cause it's a good introduction and get real experience um, for you. Those are really valued, um, but I think an entry level job would be great. And that's why I think internships or job shadow programs are very important. So then you could have that, that window um, right away, but please do check it out. Please call me if you have any questions as well, but you would see all the qualifications listed, what's um, required and um, and then you can then plan at that time, you know, what's your career path. And, and please do call me if um, you need uh, more information. All right. Thank you for that kind offer. Um, Mr. Cervantes, any advice on the application process, which I know in the, you know, with your background might be a little bit different, but, but please share some insights. Yeah, most definitely. But no, but the first, uh, you know, Dr. Trenay couldn't have said it any better. There, you have to be able to connect uh, but, you know, do, 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 a little, do a little bit of the homework, you know, see what your, if that agency is something that that mission set is something that aligns with, with your beliefs, with your values, as she mentioned, uh, because there's something to be said about that public service, you know, that that's, I think that's the biggest difference. It's not a, a pro, you're not going to come in and, and make a lot of money initially, right, uh, especially out of college, and, and, and I know it's, it, there's a lot of pressure on all of you because you have those the student loans that are going to start kicking in right shortly thereafter. You know, I have a couple of kids in college myself. So it's about the connection. Uh, truly believe in, in that public service um, appetite and, and know that uh, you have to kind of 
pay your dues, you know, work your way through. And at the end of the day, if you if you do apply, it's okay to apply. And like you said, if, if you don't get it, because there are some jobs that there, there's an expectation for some type of experience, right, uh, on, on a particular skill set, uh, you, don't, you know, don't, 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 um, don't be sad if you, if you don't get it, you know, come in, be, you know, prepare for the interview or, you know, the process and, and go through it and know that if you didn't get it, you know, if you still truly believe in that, go back and try again uh, and, and try something, something different. And, uh, and then uh, once you get in, you know, it, it's just be yourself, be yourself during an interview, uh, you know, let your qualifications from, from your, uh, your academic qualifications kind of get you, you know, you already got past the first uh, door, uh, you know, it, but, uh, you know, if you show that interest and you apply, you know, uh, and, and we get you to an interview, um, you can do that. Uh, all of the majority uh, of the federal uh, jobs, as I mentioned, go on usajobs.gov. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, from there, you can pretty much scour the entire federal government. And uh, USCIS, you know, as I mentioned, we do do uh, college fairs. Uh, you know, we go out and, and try to recruit some folks that, um, uh, you know, to see if there's a, there's any interest in, in our mission set. And, 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 it's, it, and we've been very fortunate to bring a lot of talent uh, straight out of college, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, into our workforce. And, um, and that's, um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Norman. All right. Thank you back, sir. I, I see we have our first student question, and I'm so happy to see this from Ms. Hoffman. So her question is, what trends will shape human resource departments over the next five years? Do you want to start, Dr. Tournay? Oh, sure. That, that's a really good question. No, uh, thank you. So it says, what trends are going to shape? Um, I think definitely um, the constant focus and use of technology would, would be, I think, um, would shape a future of of HR, and I think that with millennials coming in, I think that that also a lot of focus on data analysis and really using data um, dashboards to really um, help create those information that we could share with management and leadership for our decision making. Um, I think those trends would would be following through. Um, we're also going to have an exodus of um, of retirements and transitions to um, either different um, careers. I know that one of the study have noted that this has been one of the years where we've lost a lot of HR professionals. Um, as we all know, with the pandemic and um, just folks being able to really reflect on what they wanted to, to focus on. And I think probably not just in HR, but there's gonna be um, a lot of transitions. Um, we had the time to focus on, you know, what people really are passionate about, what they're good at, and they're gonna go for that. So there's a lot of that trends in HR where there's gonna be an increase in retirement, but then that means um, retirement and transitions. And that means that's also an increase in recruitments. And in HR and in any organization, um, it's never um, a number one um, option to just replace what you've lost. You have to really take a look at and review what, what you need now and for the future. So there's gonna be all those reorganizations, new jobs would probably emerge as we are not going to um, replace just uh, the, the job that left or the position uh, to take time to take a look at what we have. Um, the pandemic also have opened up uh, more on telecommuting and, um, and in some companies um, remote work. Um, so I think that would be a trend that's something that um, HR professionals will be um, focusing. As we know, telecommuting is not new in the workplace. Um, it's been around since 1970s and, and it's really in regards to what's stopping it from um, being more successful, being used more. Um, some of the studies have seen that, you know, it's really on culture and, and what uh, the, the leadership and what that organization wanted to stand for so and and be and what services you wanted to provide and HR is going to be a partner and a forefront and figuring that out what that means for um, organizations at this time so I could see those main things that we're going to be dealing with. Right. Great. Thank you for the answer. And again, thanks uh, to the student for the question. Uh, what would you like to add, Mr. Cervantes? 
Uh, no, so spot on, uh, Dr. Turney. You know, digitization, uh, multi-generational workforce, and uh, and just being able to figure out how to provide those services, how to create a culture uh, uh, from our HR perspective of, of continuous customer service. Uh, uh, you know, from from long distance, uh, we are in the process of of shrinking down again because of the environment. Um, kind of uh, catapulted us into it. It is exactly that. Is is that uh, we are starting to our, our jobs are going to come out where uh, remote work will be optional, uh, where somebody can be living in Utah and still work for the California Service Center. Um, you know, so those are things that are so different from from you know prior to the pandemic because we are very we were very paper centric. Uh, as I mentioned, you know that benefit comes in. Yes, it gets, digi- gets digitized, but at the end, there's there's something that needs to get shipped out, a decision that it, that needs to get shipped out to to the individual from wherever country he or she applied. Well, now our process is, is how do we get that digitization at their fingertips at whatever country they're applying from, from that embassy or whatever, where it comes in all in electronic, you know, in electronic format, you know, everything filled out, and we can, can send the decision back. So it's definitely a lot of a lot of change, a lot of transformation coming, and and to me, you know, it's exciting. It's all exciting because every day you'll be um, you'll be gainfully employed for for lack of a better term, and it'll be some days will be great, some days will will be not so great. But you know that that's uh, that's that's uh, that's why I love to come into work. It, it doesn't feel like work because there's always something that uh, we're, you know because we're dealing with with people uh, day in and day out. So, right. Thank you. Okay. This is, um, you know, request for uh, for those in attendance that have a question. This will, this is your last window. Uh, would love to see another question. So we're uh, rewarding those of you who took the time this morning to actually attend live. Uh, that that's the benefit you have. Um, while you're thinking of those questions, let me bring to your attention in the chat um, that if this was of interest to you, uh, we've had three of these events already, and you'll see that I've posted the YouTube recording for our event, uh, the criminal justice themed one, our public affairs themed event, our project management themed event. This is the HR event. So at the end of this, uh, a video will be prepared so you could watch again, you can share. I know um, I, I'm excited to use uh, these in some of my classes to help students, you know, wanting to learn more about careers in the federal government. Uh, and then coming up October 13th, there will be one for those, those of you in engineering or knowing folks in engineering would, would love your help in uh, encouraging people to attend. And for those of you interested in computer science information management, uh, that, you know, you just heard about data, you've heard about uh, dashboards, right? Computer information management is also a big part of HR. Um, you know, in my, I've gone from, you know, tech to, to HR, I, I've seen HRIS systems develop during my career. So uh, that might be of interest to some of you in this audience, you know, perhaps more than the engineering. So that's there in the chat with the dates. Um, and to learn more about this, uh, you know, uh, series and this overall initiative, we've got the Volker Alliance G2U uh, link for you and then the Southern California GTU organization. For those of you who want to stay in touch, because in the past, panelists have been willing to take an email from uh, an interested audience member and, and really customize it, right? Ask that specific question or, or give a little bit insight for that, that need you might have a month from now, um, maybe it's six months from now. So, so that's a, a way you can get um, in touch with the OVAR organization. And I'm going to share my email as the moderator. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to share the panelists' emails, but I would be happy on your behalf to, to email Dr. Tornay, Mr. Cervantes, um, you know, and, and see if, if they're willing to share a little bit more because I'm, I'm very grateful for what they've, sh- they've shared. All right, so that, that vamping, you know, went on long enough to see if there's another student question. I don't see one. So I kind of have a, a concluding thought for our panelists. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity to try to give back in, in just a small way. So maybe starting with, with you, Mr. Cervantes, um, you know, help help to sell your current agency uh, to those listening. You know, what what are uh, and it might be a reminder of points you've already made, but this is your opportunity to end strong. What are some of the best things about where you're working and why the audience themselves might want to work or they might want to tell somebody they know, hey, I think a career in there um, would be a great fit because um, of these wonderful benefits that are often not financial. Uh, they would get by by serving where you serve today, if you don't mind, Hector. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
so so again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. And, and and you know, it's you have a big decision and a very bright future to go. And uh, you know, you you know, consider public service. Uh, you know, maybe I'm a little biased because you know I, I've served in uniform and, and out. Uh, but you know, there's nothing more rewarding. Uh, you know, whether uh, you know coming to this organization. You know, it, it, as I mentioned, it was it was it was different because I never thought it would happen that way. And just knowing that you are realizing somebody's uh, uh, dream to come to, to to our great nation and and, uh, and and just be able to to be a citizen or or work or whatever. There's so many facets to to the, and, and benefits that we grant. Uh, again, that I, I think just knowing that we're we're doing our little um, um, share of that uh, and and and, and have, being part of that, I think it's it's a great thing. You know, the the agencies. You know, we're always there's always going to be people that are going to want to come in and pursue that dream, and uh, that's what we're here for to make sure that that it's all done lawfully. And then, then, and then that we get, uh, uh, you know, keep adding to the diversity that makes us great. So, um, you know, USCIS, I think it's great. Uh, if you have any questions, you'll, you'll see us. You know, go talk to your career, your counselors uh, 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 at your local schools. You know, you, they'll have a brochure because, again, if it's within the the uh, 100 mile radius, if there so there was a school we went to to it and and we participated in those job fairs. So. Um, that, that's really all I have. And again, thank you for, for, uh, for attending. Oh, that, that's so Dr. helpful. Thank, thank, thank you so much. And Dr. Tournay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Norman. And, and um, thank you, Mr. Cervantes for that. So I'm going to make my pitch for the CSU why, you know, you would um, love and I think work here at the CSU system. As I noted, we have 23 campuses and, um, and at the Chancellor's Office, there's actually 24 sites from, from Northern California to Southern California. So, so from Humboldt to San Diego um, um, State, um, be part of of uh, CSU where dreams do come true in regards to um, having that higher education, not just a degree, but the experience and creating um, that network, lifelong um, network. Um, our staff, our faculty, administrators are all committed to our student success. Hence, we do have the graduation initiative uh, 2025, where we're continue to grow and improve and contribute to and enhance um, our students' experiences and what's fueled California and, and the whole country. It's affordable, high quality education and be part of that no matter what role, HR, faculty, um, you know, staff members, I think um, we're here and I know I put in our link there, please do call me if you have any questions. I've had such great experience being part of the CSU, I've been here for 14 years, worked at a campus and now at the Chancellor's office and we're just, we're going to stay strong through the pandemic and I think that, you know, getting a higher education and Thank you, thank you to all of you, whether it's CSU, UC, I think private university, keep at it. We need you, we need new ideas. Please come uh, work for CSU and other government agencies. We need your talent and we welcome you. So so thank you and it's been a pleasure to, to be with you. Um, I know Dr. Norman, um, I've given the, the email. Um, I'm online. We're public. You could search me. You could email me. It's jtornay at calstate.edu. Um, be happy to um, answer any other questions as well. Right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that kind offer, uh, for, for sharing, and, you know, as well as for all the words of wisdom. It's, it's now, um, you know, a great pleasure for me to thank some of the people behind the scenes. We're going to thank our panelists, but let me not forget to thank those who made this event possible. There actually is a fair amount of planning in finding the guest speakers, arranging the moderation, and I want to acknowledge my co-chair of the committee that brought this to you, Katherine Hansen, who works for the Federal Executive Board. Um, you will see her email in the chat. Uh, and then I want to also thank um, the first person I know at Space Force, which is really cool. I want to thank Ms. Crystal Murray for, for the introduction and for her assistance. And uh, it goes without saying, we, we need to um, you know, not forget somebody uh, without whom uh, none of this would work, Edward, who's providing support from what we call SCAG, uh, the Southern California uh, Association of, of Governments. 
and, and then Debbie Dillon, uh, she's done some work as well in preparing uh, folks, sending out uh, the list. So uh, it took a lot of people here. I want to thank California State University Dominguez Hills for, um, you know, for my position that allowed me to serve today, uh, moderating our excellent panelists. And um, I guess, let me just have a shout out behind me, that screen, that's a brand new building that, uh, you know, thank the people of California for helping to fund our innovation and structure building. So should you want to come campus and meet with me in person, fourth floor of that building. So I uh, would love to see, see folks, if you want to explore a career in, in HR, you want to talk to me about educational paths, uh, you know, I've gone through SHRM programs, the PHR program you've heard, and, and know this is going to be a very rewarding a career for some of you watching and, and some of you in the audience today uh, would love to be of help and and you can also find me on linkedin right uh, uh, as well as the university in the email that i provided t norman at csudh.edu so with that um ordinarily i'd have people open their mics in a webinar uh, if, if you can do the uh hand clap or however we could take a second to thank our panelists i, I certainly you know i'm indebted to you and think this was a, a wonderful program Thank you, Dr. Tournay. Thank you, Mr. Cervantes.